My name is Rod Hedgins, I'm the president of SIBO. Uh, we'd like to welcome the candidates for the uh, 10th Congressional District. Uh, on Monday, October the 27th, I'd like to begin by recognizing our elected officials and anyone that's running for office, if we have anybody. Commissioner Joe Belcher, Buckham County Commission. Black Mountain Alderman Larry Harris. In the back. Do we have anybody else that I missed? No, well, we're, uh, we're looking forward to this. Now we'll have uh, Josh Holmes who will present uh, the Pledge of Allegiance and the prayer. Let's pray first. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day and uh, this time together. We thank you for all the beauty that you surrounded us with here in West North Carolina. We thank you for our friends that are gathered in this room and for these candidates and their willingness to debate before us. Thank you for the freedoms that we enjoy in this country to do so, Lord, and we thank you for those who uh, have fought and continue to fight to preserve those freedoms. Lord, as we go into these elections, we ask that you give us wisdom to choose leaders that are pleasing in your sight and let all that we say and do be pleasing to you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thanks, Josh. I know everybody's looking forward to hearing from the candidates from the U.S. Uh, Congress District 10. The rules for today's forum are as follows. The candidates will be given two minutes for opening remarks. Then they will have a series of questions from SIBO. The candidates will be given two minutes to respond. Patty will keep the time on that. If an opponent is named during the two minutes, we will allow the opponent 30 seconds to respond. Each candidate for U.S. Congress District 10 will be asked the same question. For the last question of the, from the organization, each candidate will be allowed to ask his opponent one question. So you might be thinking about that. If we have time at the end, we will take questions from the audience. Although the public is present and welcome at our meeting due to constraints SIBO members will be given first priority, but the rule is that any question asked must be asked to each of the candidates. I will not allow any one candidate to be singled out. To close, each candidate will be given 30 seconds for final remarks. The candidates, if you don't already know, are Con Congressman Patrick McHenry and Tate McQueen. Thanks for coming. Now let's get started with the opening statements. Congressman McHenry, would you start us off, please? Uh, for sure. Uh, it's an honor to represent Buncom County, and uh, the last two years have been uh, uh, very interesting for me because I had not previously represented Buncom County, but due to redistricting, I've learned quite a bit about uh, the economic and cultural center of the West that is, uh, that is Asheville and Buncom County. It's an honor to represent you in the United States House of Representatives. Uh, the President is talking a lot about the improving economy, but what I see here in Western North Carolina is one of still struggle for average families. Uh, working men and women, they're struggling to get full-time work, uh, they're struggling to pay the bills, they're struggling to pay the increased cost of gas and groceries at the pump, uh, I'm sorry, gas at the pumps, groceries at the grocery store. Um, and so uh, I'm trying to deal with those concerns, to make sure that we don't have rising tax bills, that the question of health care is resolved uh, and to the benefit of families and small businesses, not to the benefit of Washington as it currently is. That's the work that I'm trying to be about. And as far as manufacturing and job growth, I think it's very important that we have tax reform 
and uh, a national energy policy that uses our resources and has an all the above approach so that we can actually be more energy independent and so we can bring jobs back here. And a tax code that rewards people for being here in the United States, not simply uh, uh, pushing them overseas. Those are the things that I've been about as your representative. It's an honor to serve you. Uh, my constituents, my bosses here at home, it's a real honor to be with you today. Thanks so much, especially for what SIBO does. Uh, I confess, I, I kind of like the lunches a little bit better than the start time and the breakfast. Um, and, uh, and Mike, I, I certainly appreciate uh, a little Chick-fil-A at lunch as well. Thanks so much. God bless. And Tate. Well, it's an honor to be here, and thanks to SIBO. You know, I've worked with several SIBO members over the years, including Jan Davis, Joe Belcher, and others with the contamination in South Asheville. And I'm truly grateful to report to you that this weekend, city water lines were turned on at my house. It reflects, it reflects six and a half years of very hard work, you know, building bridges in, in our community, working with people independent of their political affiliations, making sure that we were looking after one another, as good North Carolinians do. The Congressman has spoken about the last four years and into that, the four years that preceded that. And we can go on and on, but there was a time in this country and in our state where we could have respectful disagreements, that we could have discussions that may be hard, but out of those difficult discussions, with examples like Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill, oftentimes the best solutions came forward. I'm just a school teacher. I'm not a professional politician. I have served the children of Buncombe County and Henderson County for the last 10 years and their families. What I have seen is an exclusive economy, one that has rewarded the top 1% to the tune of almost 7% in an income increase, whereas the remaining 99% have seen their wealth decrease by almost 3%. Now we can point fingers which seems to be the status quo in Washington, or we can get on with the people's business. I'm respectfully asking for your vote because I think it's time that we had a change. The Congressman has been in Washington for 10 years, and during that time we have gone from 26th worst in poverty to 11th. Today we have 38,000 children in Western North Carolina that do not know where their next meal is coming from. This campaign is about justice and compassion. It's about love and inclusion. It's about doing the work of the people. It's my honor to be here representing everyone because this campaign should be about all of the people, top to bottom and side to side. Thank you. Thank you, Tate. Appreciate it. Uh, folks, would you hold the applause till the end of the meeting, please? I would appreciate it. Now for the first question from the organization. Uh, Tate, we're going to start with you. Should there be a travel ban to and from the countries that have large numbers of Ebola cases? Well, that is a popular question that's being asked given the consequences of folks that have tested positive for Ebola in New York, riding public transit, going bowling, not to mention the healthcare workers in Dallas where I have family. In fact, my cousin, Sean, rather, lives in the same neighborhood as one of the women who's now under quarantine being treated. If we are to establish a travel ban, I hope that somebody could explain to me what that would do for international trade. We have uh, lots and lots of business relationships with the West Coast of Africa. I believe that we have to do our due diligence, that we have to have proper screening, and that we make sure that we, where there are people that are exhibiting the slightest symptom, that they are detained from travel. However, to shut down international travel coming from that area I don't believe would be prudent. Uh, this is uh, something that where we have been dealing with so much fear in our dialogues, so much fear scaring people. This is a time where we take these situations very seriously, we, re we reflect and we carefully move forward with a policy that would protect and promote health not only in the United States but throughout the world. Thank you, David. Patrick? Uh, I'm in favor of a trip. <clears throat> Excuse me, I don't have a bull, I have allergies. I am in favor of a travel ban. I think it's the right thing to do for our uh, health. Um, 
and it's not out of a lack of compassion. We uh, have troops stationed. Uh, we have about 500 uh, American fighting men and women uh, in uniform there for logistical support in the west coast of Africa and the affected region. Uh, the president has the authority as commander in chief uh, to make that directive. Uh, what I'm there to make sure of is that if anyone is affected that is uh, in, in uniform, uh, that they have the best health care in the world and they're taken care of in, in um, first order. So I think a travel ban is important. Uh, there are less than 200 people uh, that come from this affected region to the United States on a daily basis. So it's not a very significant number of people, uh, but as we found out with an infectious disease like, like Ebola, it can travel and spread widely. The science says that a quarantine of 21 days, because the incubation period for Ebola is up to 21 days, the, the science says a quarantine for 21 days is the appropriate thing. Unfortunately, the president and this administration has called for a 10-day quarantine that is, uh, of course, uh, on, uh, on the order of uh, the person who is returning back doing that voluntarily, which Dr. Spencer in, uh, in uh, New York did. And on the 11th day, when he traveled on the subway, went to a bowling alley and a number of other things, he came down with a fever of 101.3. Uh, now, it tells you the 10-day uh, quarantine period is not enough. The 21-day period is the appropriate thing. And I think it should be mandatory, not at the discretion of individuals. Thank you. Uh, Patrick, we'll ask you the second question. What is your position on illegal immigration in this country, and how do you intend on addressing this? Well, I believe that we have to have border security first and foremost, period. That is where you have to build uh, uh, the uh, credibility, if you will, in order to have any other questions about immigration reform. The biggest impediment at the moment to immigration reform, sound immigration reform, is uh, the concern that the president will not honor the law, even if we change it. Uh, we saw this with Obamacare, uh, with the president waiving a number of provisions uh, that are needlesome and troublesome, and not adhering to the rule of the law that even he's calling uh, Obamacare. Um, so if he won't do that with health care, I'm very skeptical that he would do that with immigration reforms and changes. Uh, last Congress and previous Congresses, I worked with Congressman Schuler, who represented Asheville and to the West, a Democrat, on a border security first proposal and internal enforcement. Um, it can be done in a bipartisan way. It's possible to do it in a bipartisan way, but the idea of simply legalizing a number of people who have come here illegally is not the right approach. If you don't respect the law to come and participate in our system of laws, uh, you're not going to respect the laws going forward. Um, so it's important that we have sound uh, border security first before we have any other discussions about immigration reform. Thank you. Tate? We are talking about human beings. We're talking about children. We're talking about compassion. I teach here in Buffalo County, Clyde A. Irwin. I have students that come into my classroom who have been shipped here against great odds. Because in the absence of a stable economy in Central and South America, you create vacuums where organizations like drug cartels can do real and painful damage. Where the death rate is skyrocketing, the violence is something that we can't even comprehend. And as the father of two children that are here, Lachlan and Margaret, I can't tell you that I wouldn't do the same thing if it meant saving my children's life. We don't have a sound economic policy with Central and South America because it's predicated on free trade, not fair trade. <coughs> So I think that to engage in this idea where you can round up the children and send them home without understanding what their home is like is not the best policy. I believe we have to have a pathway to citizenship. We also have to make sure that our national security is taken care of so that those that come here with criminal records and violent masks are deported. You know, in the Spanish community, they call the president the great deporter because he's deported over two million people. Now. Over the course of that time, I want it to be known that my name is Mike Queen and my family came here with Flora MacDonald. And Patrick McHenry's last name is McHenry and I don't know if yours came over during the potato famine. But we all have come here, one way or the other, another, we are all the children or descendants of immigrants. There was a time here, as I teach in U.S. history, that people traveled the Bering Land Bridge 20,000 years ago to begin 
populating this hemisphere. So I, I believe that we have to have a compassionate approach. Building walls where people can go underneath without realizing that there is an incentive. And at some, at some point, we have to punish the corporations that are rewarding them. And keep in mind that $250 million every year in our state goes from undocumented workers to our local and state coffers. Thank you. Thank you, Tate. Uh, Tate, this next question will be for you. Uh, do you favor revamping the internal revenue system? Explain. <laughs> I, I favor revamping quite a bit. Um, at some point, we may talk about the United States Environmental Protection Agency. Certainly, I would be in favor of that. With the IRS, obviously, where we're going to find common ground is that the tax code is burdensome and oftentimes unfair. Those that have done very well oftentimes can afford the type of accountants and attorneys to find the loopholes to avoid paying their fair share. Right now, we have a federal minimum wage at seven and a quarter. If you work 40 hours a week, 52 hours, I mean 52 weeks a year, you're going to be generating $15,080. The good news is if you don't have to pay federal income tax, the bad news is you don't make enough to qualify. I believe that we can restructure our tax code to continue to give working class people in this country the tax breaks that they need to stimulate the economy. Because in the Keynesian model, we know that when working class people get more money, they spend more money. And at this particular juncture, we also know that 70% of our GDP is derived from individual consumer spending. So it stands the reason that if we are to raise minimum wage, structure our tax code so that it is applied more fairly, our entire economy will be more inclusive and more beneficial to everyone, top to bottom, left to right. Thank you. Uh, Patrick? Um, well, first of all, I think we need to have fundamental tax reform on the personal income tax side and the corporate income tax side. Uh, what we see is corporations trying to go to a different tax regime, a different country around the world to, to have their corporate taxes taken from them. Uh, instead of us actually being competitive, we're becoming less competitive when it comes to uh, the highest corporate income tax rate in the first world. Uh, I think we've got to lower that rate and eliminate loopholes and, uh, and deductions for corporations so that they'll stay here in the United States and choose to invest here in the United States. On the personal income tax side, uh, I don't support raising taxes. I support uh, having fundamental tax reform so that the tax code is simpler and fairer for those in the middle, which means we eliminate <coughs> loopholes that only a, a cherished few can participate in and take advantage of. And so I think the idea of actually doing uh, tax reform should be focused more on growing the economy, growing the simplicity of the tax code, rather than trying to get more uh, from people's personal purses and wallets. I think that's the wrong approach. We pay plenty in taxes to the United States. It's a matter of uh, our government and policymakers uh, making do with what Washington takes from us at current and prioritizing the needs of our nation for the long term. That's what I've been about, that's what I've supported, and my votes go right along with that. The tough question of government spending and tax reform, I've cast those votes and proud to do it so that we can uh, grow this economy and, and, and be more competitive uh, in, around the globe. Thank you, Patrick. Patrick, you're up next. How do you intend to deal with the ISIS threat and do you favor boots on the ground, or is the air campaign enough? Explain. I favor boots on the ground. The idea that you're going to uh, use cruise missiles and, folk, and uh, planes at 30,000 feet to uh, defeat an enemy that is uh, uh, mainly built around people and trucks, um, not tanks, uh, not heavy formations, uh, this is a very different threat than what happened in World War II or uh, what we saw in Korea, it's a very different threat. And the idea that you can simply bomb from the sky and get, uh, get the uh, security on the ground that you need is, is simply not there. We, we've got the best trained, best equipped uh, military in the world. Um, it's not a matter of us using it every day, but it's a matter of us using it judiciously. I've, uh, and I've said this before, uh, I said this earlier, the president's commander in chief. I disagree with this president. I don't think you're going to find that as a shock. If you're a liberal in the crowd, you think that's bad. If you're a conservative in the crowd, you think that's bad, right? That, um, that you know, I'm a Republican and saying things about the president, you know, you may have a problem with that as a, a liberal. But uh, the fact is, 
he has the ability to uh, make big decisions for our country and our national security. What I've asked him to do, and a number of them uh, of us have asked him to do, is not simply call for the action of training uh, allies on the ground, uh, but actually have a plan. Have a cohesive, coherent plan so that we win. We don't just simply take on a challenge in the Middle East, but we win, and we make the region safer, and uh, establish a balance of power that is long-lasting so that we don't have to engage constantly in the Middle East. Uh, the fact is, this president had a plan to draw down the troops in Iraq, and we had about 1,000 troops as of six months ago. And what we're seeing the destabilization of Iraq and the region is largely because we didn't have any footprint there to combat. I think we need to maintain a, a footprint there so that we can battle the bad guys and defeat them where they are. Thank you. Tate? Well, I believe that much of the problem is the rhetoric that we continue to hear. I'm a history teacher. It pains me to over and over and over again see the lessons of our own history not adhered to, much less the lesson of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union doesn't exist anymore because they went into a third world country called Afghanistan. They were there for 10 years. They depleted their treasury. They don't exist anymore. The difference between the Soviet Union and the United States is our military is built by private corporations and funded by public money. <coughs> now, you know, I wouldn't be the teacher that I think that I am if I didn't bring you a little visual. You see the red here? That represents the amount of money in our budget that goes to war, nuclear weapons, and defense. It happens to be 57%. Now, if you're going to deplete our treasury, and worse yet, deplete our national treasures, our young men and women asked again to go into another quagmire when there are neighbors to Syria, neighbors like Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Turkey. They have the funds. They have the money. They have a military that they have purchased from our industry here in America. But when you look at this and you go to how much of that budget is spent on veterans, and it's less than 6%. And 6% is spent on our education. And in, in, in the context of small business, our budget spends, you know, less than 5%. And I just think that it's interesting that we have people who have not served wanting to send more people to serve without realizing how important it is to take care of them when they come home. Because if you can't get that right, there is no point in sending them to go again. I have met with far too many veterans who are suffering. 51,000 veterans and their families rely on supplemental nutrition assistance to make ends meet with food in this state. And yet the congressman voted against those SNAP benefits. So I believe we have to let the other countries in the region do the fighting with us playing a support role. Thank you. Hey, this question is for you. What steps need to be taken for industries that have moved overseas to relocate here in the U.S. Explain. Well, I can speak to that uh, from a familiar perspective. My Uncle Tom Broyhill in Lenore, his granddaddy and his great uncle started the Broyhill pressure factory. And Tom was the last Broyhill in the factory even after they sold it and they relocated it to South Korea. And he would laugh about how often the furniture would come back from South Korea with four left feet on it. And I was telling him that I might say something about his politics, but I was kidding. Uh, you know, Tom understood that when you give rewards and incentives for manufacturers to locate overseas, and I do remember the esteemed words of H. Ross Perot, who warned us about NAFTA, who warned us what would happen if we started to relocate south of the border. And then we went west of those borders. We have to take away those incentives. We have to have corporations paying their fair share to do business in America, and we need to reward them when they do well by asking them to do good as a result of their prosperity. So I believe that we're going to have to change the way we do our tax code with those businesses to bring them home. We must stop in giving the incentives to locate overseas. There are too many good working class Republicans and Democrats and independents in the 10th district there are too many shuttered plants and facilities that have their logistics already waiting. The buildings are already there, and they're dormant. And the people want to work. The congressman said that he didn't think it was his, his responsibility to represent the 
nor those that didn't want to work. I'm going to be going to some neighborhoods this afternoon where I have traveled with my friend Russell Johnson time and time again, and I haven't met anybody that said they didn't want to work. The problem is you have to bring jobs back, and you have to actually have an aggressive policy that doesn't reward them for taking them overseas. The people here need jobs. They need to be able to take care of their families. And that's what I'm going to do as your next representative. Thank you, Tate. Uh, Patrick, uh, I detected a little bit of challenge on that last question. Sure. Of the I ISIS. Think, look, you I, get a few more seconds if you'd like to sure. address uh, that. I, if I could just uh, say this. The idea that you raise taxes on corporations and individuals, and that's going to be a draw to come back to the United States, is absolutely soundly absurd. It defies economics. It defies rational thought. And the idea that simply raising taxes is the answer, it's simply wrong. I think we have to have a more competitive tax code, a more competitive regulatory regime, a national energy policy, and sound trade policy. Those things will keep jobs here in the United States. It will mean that people will choose to come to the United States to start their business, to create jobs, and to grow this economy. That's what I'm focused on. Okay. Just one point of order. You know, if we're going to talk about being rational, let's talk about how those companies got there to begin with. You have to take responsibility for being part of that problem. So okay, I'll, this is not a, a right. go back and forth. Okay, thank you. <laughs> you feel like uh, you answered your question, Patrick? You had enough time? Oh, I'm fine. I, I okay. think a, a sound national energy policy speaks okay. for itself. Okay, Move, moving along. Uh, this is for Patrick. One project that we have all worked for in many years is the future I-26 through Asheville. We're told that the Federal Highway Administration is seeking eight lanes. What are your thoughts regarding this position? Well, I think uh, a lot has happened just in the last uh, year uh, here in this community to get resolved around a plan, a single plan uh, that all the stakeholders can come to the table with. Uh, and it's uh, Republicans and Democrats, it's the far progressive left and the far conservative right, libertarians, cats and dogs, everyone getting along around this plan. And I think that's a very hopeful sign so that we can actually go through this, this process at the state level and get approval with national highways. I think it's got to be led by locals and not folks out of Raleigh or Washington to dictate what this plan is, but what's in best keeping for the needs of Asheville and for the whole region. Thank you. Uh, Tate? Well, I've been here for 10 years, and when I moved back home to North Carolina and we decided to come to Asheville, that was one of the things we often heard driving to Earth Fair to get our groceries. And certainly we have to improve our infrastructure. We're talking about constructing new roads, and it's very important that we look at the footprint that it will leave, also the transportation, transportation systems that we use. The other thing that you know, I believe that's very important to bring up is our crumbling infrastructure here in North Carolina. There are over 5,000 bridges in a state of disrepair or functionally obsolete. 45% of our roads are in a state of disrepair. That costs North Carolina motorists $1.5 billion a year in repairs, which equates to $241 per motorist. We have to take care of our infrastructure <coughs> on a systemic level. And we do have to involve the stakeholders, the business community, as well as those that have a concern for the environment. Uh, I hope that we'll be talking about environmental policy and uh, our views on that. But if we continue down this path of building first and asking questions later, we're going to have real problems. Thanks, Dave. Now, for the favorite part, you get to ask your opponent a question. I have one second to think about that. Tate, you get to ask Patrick a question. Patrick, you have two minutes to answer. Well, my, my concern obviously is that when our community needed the congressman in South Asheville, when we are in our greatest time of need, working class Republicans, Democrats, independents, people who were vulnerable, people who trusted the US EPA and NC Diener, the congressman turned his back on us. And I told him privately the reason I'm running primarily was because I had been representing my community with others in our community, and we never got the help that we needed on a federal level. We never held those officials accountable. We've seen people like 
Franklin Hill, who's probably one of the most corrupt officials at EPA, matriculate now to head the national Superfund section for US EPA. And so it became a question of compassion. And I'm trying to figure out where that is. When we have a congressman that votes against minimum wage at seven and a quarter, votes against the Lilly Ledbetter Act for fair pay, votes against fully funding supplemental nutrition assistance, Votes against. Let me get a question, please. Well, I, I would like to know, in the spirit of being a history teacher, we come forward 60 years from a very dark period in our history, led by one Joseph McCarthy. And in the spirit of Joseph Welch, I would just like to ask have you no sense of compassion, <coughs> sir? Uh, the answer is yes, I do. All right. That's answer. Uh, Patrick, you have a question for Tate. Uh, Mr. McQueen, uh, you've, uh, we're talking to a group of business leaders. What relief are you going to give for small businesses that are suffering under the expense of Obamacare, the lack of lending as a result of Dodd-Frank, um, and, uh, and, and the ongoing challenges of a weak economy? What answers are you going to provide to them on Obamacare and Dodd-Frank? What relief are you going to give them? Well, you know, oftentimes when I hear the word Obamacare, I think of a friend of mine who said that you guys ought to be calling it Obama Scare. You know, the, the fact is, is that small businesses were deprived of the subsidies to bridge the gap, to help people have health care in America. I believe that health care is a right, not a privilege. And I think that when you have children and adults dying, at an estimated rate of 2,800 in this state. That's five a day from treatable illnesses because of the coverage gap from our governor and the legislature denying those Medicaid funds from the federal government. Now, when you ask me this, I actually, I actually started a small business in Athens, Georgia. I've actually worked in a small business. I've balanced the books, I've cut the checks. I've taken a pay cut so that I could pay my employees back in 1994, 95, more than minimum wage at the time, because it was about shared sacrifice and shared opportunity and shared profit. So when you're asking me about what I would do to offset the cost of Obamacare, which is actually the Affordable Care Act, I would say that we need to fund it. We're the only country since 1972 with a free market system that hasn't moved to a universal health care system but is a single payer. We have more people being covered now in North Carolina. We have more children being covered that can stay on their parents' plan until they're 25. And we're not having people cut off because of pre-existing conditions. We're going to have to have those federal subsidies. And again, I'll just simply refer to you with this one graphic in red. Can we not back off of the wasteful spending with our defense policy and reorient it towards the character of our, our people and be good to one another with our policies? I think that we can do this and we can remain secure and safe and sound in America, but we've got to knock off the fear tactics. Thanks, Tate. You're welcome. Now for the, uh, we're going to open the floor up for questions. Uh, as we said before, that. Uh, the uh, members of SEMO will have the uh, priority, uh, and we're coming. The man has the microphone. All right, sir. Uh, yes, sir. What are your respective positions on the Second Amendment? You ask him. Both. 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 Yes. Okay. okay. You want to start with? Yeah. In fact, you're first. On. Start with Patrick. Uh, I'm a member, a life member of the NRA. I support our Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. Period. Thank you. Okay. Hey. Cetera, a few times, right? I'm not a lifelong member of the NRA. I am a, a lifelong shooter. Targets with my Uncle Tom Roy Hill, my father. I've enjoyed shooting as a child. There's a big difference, though. Our founders did not envision street sweeper shotguns. They certainly didn't envision high capacity clips nor armor piercing rounds. To give a statement about being a lifelong member and supporting the Second Amendment without mentioning Seattle and the tragedy. Once again, another school shooting. I think we're up to almost 80 now in about, uh, what is it, less than a year. We've had 90 school shootings. Now, when we were in Rutherford, the concern that you expressed there was the connection between mental health and those uh, acts of gun violence. 
my question then was, what is the NRA's leadership doing to prevent those that are mentally ill from acquiring those weapons? And do you not see the relationship between folks who need their medications when they lose those medications becoming mentally ill again? And the connection that we are, you know, in not a black and white world, it is a gray world, and things are related to one another. I believe that people should have the right to keep and bear arms, period. I believe that we should have effective background checks, even at gun shows. I believe that anyone that's convicted of a felony, an act of violence, should be deprived of that opportunity to buy guns there. At the very least, let's make it more challenging for them to acquire those weapons. But it gets back to a, big, a much bigger issue, and that issue is conflict resolution. Where does, where does that conflict come from? Coretta Scott King said that poverty is a form of violence. And when you put that kind of stress on people, day after day, and you minimize their hope for better opportunities, we're going to see a higher divorce rate, more drug abuse, and more acts of violence. If I may respond, um, none of the policies the gentleman outlined would have stopped the horrible tragedy that happened in a high school in Connecticut. None of those policies would have stopped a person from taking their mother's uh, collectible weaponry and using it to commit an act of violence. Early detection of that mental health issue is, is the answer to this question. It's a deeper problem than just simply demagoguing the Second Amendment. Well, clearly I didn't, dem I didn't demagogue the Second Amendment. And for, and for the record, you know, I would like to know what your policy is with regard to mental health. It's one thing to say something, it's another thing to have a plan for what you've said. So what is your plan for dealing with the mental health issue in America? Representative Tim Murphy's uh, bill, he is a uh, psychologist uh, by training, um, and he wrote legislation that takes on this question of early detection and takes federal resources coordinated with the state and the localities and delivers the results for people. Thank you. Next question. We're getting closer to the microphone, Peter. What do you have? Uh, this question, both of you. Uh, Start with Tate and for the answer. Well, it's going to be a question for both yeah, of you. Whoever right. you want to start, start to answer it. What is, elected, what is your position in support of the nation of Israel? That's a very good question. I think that the nation of Israel should be held to the same standards as the rest of the nations around the world. We have a long relationship with Israel, and I don't believe that we should have policies that are against who we are as Americans simply because we have that relationship. We need to have standards for their government and the way that they have, at times, lost their way, especially with regard to Palestinians and the Palestinian question as far as a two-state solution. And we can't just cloak ourselves in the Israeli flag and sacrifice the American flag at the same time. Uh, I believe in a strong relationship with all of the countries in that region. We do have a long and endearing relationship with Israel, and I don't believe that we can go along with anything that creates more instability in that region, that we need to be an agent of healing, not an agent uh, that, that resorts to, to uh, military reactions or supporting military reactions as the first reaction. Uh, I'm a strong believer in our, our relationship with Israel. I believe we're blessed as a country because of our connection with the nation of Israel. That's how so that's been consistent with my votes, that's consistent with my public actions, and that's consistent with my private prayers. And so I believe this connection means a couple of different things. First of all, Israel's the longest standing democracy in the Middle East. They were the only democracy in the Middle East before Iraq had their version of a democracy. So, first of all, it, they're the most free nation in the Middle East as well. And to equivocate and say that Iran or uh, Turkey or Jordan or Saudi Arabia or Egypt is, is equivalent to Israel in terms of freedom, their respect not just for uh, diversity of religious uh, um, uh, faiths in, in their midst, but also their respect for women and women's rights, families, and the freedom of speech. 
Those things are far different than the rest of the Middle East. So I think we have to honor that relationship. It means in terms of what we do on the international front. To actually say to, to Israel that they have to drop leaflets before they take action against bad people that are firing rockets at them is absolutely absurd. We didn't do that when we started bombing uh, ISIL ta targets in the Middle East. So the demand of an ally and friend that they do something that we won't ourselves do is absurd and dumb. The uh, other thing, I sort of care about this. I'm kidding. Uh, excuse the sarcasm. But uh, the other thing is we have to make sure that we maintain this first order connection for technology. Our military to military relationship with Israel is a very important one on the technology front, and that exchange is very important. And so I think it's very important that we stand tight with Israel, and we will be much stronger, and they will be much stronger, and the world will be, will be much st more stable if that is the case. Thank you, Patrick. Next question. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for being willing to serve the uh, United States and our district. I appreciate it. Um, as a business person, one of the things that uh, confuses me about immigration is sometimes being able to identify the person in front of me as being legal or illegal. Uh, I also think that the Social Security number is our most important number associated with any human being. And frankly, Denmark has national security guards. Would you support a national system of uh, security guards or, or identification cards which secure the social, social security numbers and make it easier for me to know whether or not I can hire someone? Patrick. Yes. Uh, and E-Verify was the first step of this. But the idea that as a matter of federal uh, policy, that we simply say we're going to have a porous border, we're not going to know who's going to come over that border, and we're going to look to small and large businesses to be the enforcer of immigration law is not responsible at all. And so I think we need to have real border security. You also have to have the ability to verify uh, that, that employees are, that people are here legally. Um, and if we're not a nation of laws, if we're not a nation of, of borders, um, then we're not a nation at all. And so um, the, the policies I think we need to put in place, uh, not, not just simply punish employers for hiring illegals, but actually do the hard work to make sure that those that are here, uh, those that are here are here legally and can participate uh, in both our economy and uh, in our communities. Thank you. Next question. Uh, oh, well, excuse me. I'm sorry, Tate. <laughs> okay. Well, again, we have to look at the problem universally, understand that we can mitigate the influx of immigration if we do do our part to stabilize the economies in Central and South America. Uh, I would support an even application of those cards so that everyone had to carry them. My father-in-law came from Wales in 1967 to go to work at NASA. He's a first-generation immigrant. I married his, his daughter, Bethan. And again, this idea of throwing up fences and, you know, with the congressman's record on the border voting against doubling the number of troops on the ground, we have to do what it's required of us to balance it out. As I said, about $250 million a year from undocumented workers goes into local and state coffers. If you took a quarter of a billion dollars out of those funds, it would have an immediate impact on our first responders and our infrastructure. We have to have a pathway to citizenship. We have to hold those that have come here uh, with violent records accountable. And we have to make sure that the children who came here through no fault of their own are treated with respect and dignity and are not vilified and turned into this enemy. We can do these things because when America has been under duress, we have always risen to that occasion. And we have great men and women who have set a great example for us to follow. People like Franklin Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, Fannie Lou Hamer, Murley Evers. So many people, when they faced those crises, showed us that they were opportunities for us to reveal the true nature of ourselves. Thank you, Teddy. Bob? Yes, thank you. Uh, six years ago, the existing president went in office when we had approximately seven and a half to eight trillion dollars in debt. We now have 18 trillion dollars in debt that they admit to, so it's probably more than that. My, I would like to know what your guys, are, what opinions you've got or ideas you've got to head us towards, you know, getting rid of this debt. 
Tate. Well, <clears throat> there are two things that are of concern for most people when talking about debt and how it relates to deficit. I believe that we have to stimulate this economy. I believe that we have to invest in our infrastructure. We have to create jobs at home. It may require deficit spending on the short term, but that will stimulate our economy. We have to raise our minimum wage to a living wage. Now, 600 economists, seven of them being Nobel Prize winners in economics, have signed a letter of support stating that the minimum wage would be $10.10 .10 by 2016. The immediate impact to our economy is twofold. Number one, there's an excess of $50 billion that would immediately go into our economy. We have three quarters of a million North Carolinians that would immediately benefit from that. And for those entitlement programs, which is an interesting concept, those entitlement programs for support, like SNAP and Medicaid, those would be decreased by $8 billion immediately. So I'm, I'm one who believes that we can stimulate the economy, pay down our debt by reevaluating the way we invest our money. Continuing to get bogged down into one quagmire after another quagmire that, again, drains not only our national treasury, but our national treasures is something that we can no longer afford to do. I believe that if we do look at an approach that everyone can prosper, everyone can be included. The Congressman talks about wanting to grow a bigger pie. I say we need more seats at the table. I think that we can meet somewhere in the middle, but it's going to take compromise. It's going to take real leadership. It's going to take people who are willing to stop the rhetoric and stop the infighting for their own personal gain and get on with the business of the people. Thanks, Pete. Patrick? Well, simply dealing with minimum wage and more deficit and, and proposing more deficit spending doesn't actually help improve this debt situation. So, I look, we just disagree on, on how to address this. I've supported uh, the, the Ryan budget, right? This was a big talk in the last presidential race, a big talk in the last four years was the fact that House Republicans proposed a balanced budget and did so without raising taxes and, in fact, put in a two-rate uh, modified flat tax as a part of this that dealt with, didn't touch Social Security, uh, but dealt with Medicare. Not for those that are at or near retirement age. In fact, if you're over 55 years old, uh, your Medicare is unchanged, untouched, unless you wanted to opt for the system that younger folks will be able to access. Now, what that did was uh, give us certainty over the period of the next 30, 40, and 50 years that we can actually start bending this cost curve, this, uh, this spending uh, curve. And so this was much ballyhooed that, that people were going to get thrown out of office for supporting a policy that actually fixes the problem. And I'm willing to cast the tough votes and make the case that we have to fix and save these important programs like Medicare to make sure the next generation actually has the access to Medicare that the current generation does. Which means for my generation, it's probably going to look different than it is for those that are currently receiving it. Uh, but we can make those uh, uh, changes, we can make that prioritization, and we can make those tough choices coming out of Washington. The idea of simply saying we're going to tax more and spend more and we're going to have prosperity. Well, look, we, if, if that's the case, then everybody would be uh, living high on the hog at the moment. We've seen more spending out of Washington. We've seen this president more than double our national debt. And we don't have anything to benefit from it. We don't have long-lasting prosperity. And in fact, we're either, even further into hawk uh, to China than we were six years ago. That's not the right path. We've got a better way. Thanks, Patrick. Now, next question. Thank you, John. What's the, what do you feel is the major impediment for full employment in uh, Western North Carolina? What do you plan to do about it? Patrick? Well, the, the, the major impediment to full-time employment right now is Obamacare. Obamacare defines full-time work as 30 hours a week. We can fix this problem by going back to a traditional deficit uh, 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 definition of full-time work is 40 hours a week. That will help grow employment. Um, I think uh, health care is number one. The cost that it, it puts on small businesses' backs uh, means that small businesses are willing uh, to, to give people longer hours. Uh, they're willing to do many different things except grow employment to flip over that threshold of 50 employees where they would have to uh, uh, deal with the weight and the cost structure of Obamacare. That's number one. Number two, we don't have a national energy policy at current. 
We should be using our natural resources out of the ground, oil, natural gas, even coal, to make sure that we fund for the long term our, uh, our uh, economic opportunities, which are wind and solar and, and a number of other opportunities for us when it comes to clean, renewable energy. But we have to have an environmental policy and a national energy policy that rewards uh, production of American energy. Uh, that's two. Number three, I mentioned it before, the tax code. The tax code is an impediment to growing employment. Tax increases are an impediment to growing employment. I think we need to have a fair, simpler tax code. That's number three. And then number four, we need to make sure we've got the best education and training programs in the world for manufacturing and high tech, from A to Z in our economy, to make sure that our young people coming up have the opportunity to fill their brains, or to get the hands-on knowledge that they need to actually get in good jobs for the long term. Those are my priorities. Those are the things I'm focused on and providing relief where it needs to be relief and doing the tough things to make sure that we have long-range policy to make us stronger and more stable. Thank you, Patrick. Tate? I'm trying to figure that one out. Um, let's see. If you're suggesting that you increase more hours per week, then that would actually take more jobs from people because more people are having to work because they're getting less hours. So that's a paradox that I'm fascinated to see be resolved. As a teacher, I give tests that I make. They're not the standardized tests that Pearson's profiting from by the brain drain that stumps us from having critical thought in a classroom. They're the type of tests that I generate. And oftentimes, one of the answers is all of the above. And I put that on there because oftentimes that's not the right answer. And in this case of an all of the above energy policy, that is not the right answer. It is, it is science and rational thinking that tells us that an energy policy that involves hydraulic fracking is a course set for disaster. My community has seen the impacts of toluene, benzene, methyl naphthalene, a lot of the contaminants that are in the fracking process where you wreck good water permanently to extract a little bit more out of Mother Nature. That's not an effective policy. An effective policy is looking at as our generation's Apollo mission, not to the moon, but to become energy independent, self-sufficient, where we weren't funding terrorists through our uh, marriage to petroleum. I haven't taken any money from Halliburton. And I often wonder if that's why we never got the response in South Asheville because of Halliburton's role in the CTS saga, but I also haven't taken any money from big oil, big banks. I have taken money from the people who have given it to me to represent them the way I have in my community. You asked a question about jobs. I answered it earlier, sir, and it's very important to me because I see kids that are having to work in my classroom to help their families make ends meet, which radically altered the way I looked at homework. When I go to the grocery store after a soccer match and see these kids stocking the shelves at Ingalls knowing that they don't want to be there at 11 o'clock at night, knowing that we have put too much of the burden with budgets like the Ryan budget, too much of that burden on the backs of working class Republicans and Democrats and independents. We don't ever hear people talking about working class Republicans. We hear about business and business owners. Good business owners take care of their employees. They, they have a shared sacrifice. They do what is necessary to create that loyalty. It's not about hours per week. It's about lifelong connections and commitments to one another. It's about relationships. And again, it's about arcing back to our true selves, being good to one another as employee and employer. If we do that, then we can fix these problems. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Patrick, I heard a, a small challenge in that first part. Do I need Did you want to respond? <laughs> Did you want to respond or just uh, uh, we're ready for the final uh, wrap-up? There is zero proof. Um, that uh, fracking uh, has polluted any groundwater in the United States of America. Uh, and if you have a case, you can make national news because there's not yet been a case where fracking has caused groundwater pollutants. Now, that is the case. Now, the question of a type of technology to harvest energy out of the ground, I think that will be regulated at the state level. And the state of North Carolina is taking moves to do that. Other states are doing the same. And the federal government, there's not, um, there's not currently the regulatory uh, architecture for it. So this will be done at the state level. 
Now, <clears throat> we've heard, and it's been printed, that you, say, that, that you say you're not a scientist, and yet you're going to say that there's no empirical evidence, despite the tsunami of information from scientists who have universally said it is unwise to use hydraulic fracturing because of the damage it does to our water supply. Thank that you. is a fact. The other part of the problem is, is that if my child goes to the, if my child gets sick, I do not say I'm not a doctor and then not go to the doctor. I go to the doctor because I'm not one. I would encourage you to in engage with people like Jerry Ensminger's people at Camp Lejeune to see the real damage that these types of policies do for real people who are really suffering, who end up burying their loved ones from exposure to these toxins. That type of disconnect is something that is dreadfully wrong with Washington, D.C., and that's why we need to change. Thank you, Pete. We got a real quick final question. I've got my 30 seconds. Okay. Good morning. Uh, I, I need a quick, two questions, and it'll be quick. One question. Oh, one question, okay. Well, I'd like to ask about the DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act. Uh, in terms of equal protection under the 14th Amendment for all citizens of the United States, how do you both stand on the, the new uh, ruling on allowing for all of our human uh, citizens to have the equal rights and protections under uh, under the law to be married as they choose to do in their own privacy? Okay. My great uncle Earl Adams was with a man named Jack Reed for 50 years. It had no bearing on my relationship with my wife. If two men or two women want to have their marriage, it's not going to cause me to take my ring off with my wife. The relationship I have with my wife will determine the success of our marriage. If my son should come to me someday and tell me very quietly that he's gay, I will tell him that I love you today the same as I did the day you were born because that's what parents do. That is the commitment that we make. And if my daughter were to come to me and tell me that she was a lesbian, I would say to her, I love you today the way I did the day you were born, and nothing can ever change that. It is the 14th Amendment. It guarantees equal protection under the law. It is time that we respect people and stop denigrating people. Let them be themselves. Be true to themselves. There was a time when my mother's favorite person to see on TV was Rock Hudson. And now we know that he had to have marriages to conceal his true identity and his true self. And I think that that's shameful. And I would ask Patrick McHenry that if you were gay, how would it make you feel to be denied those same protections because you happen to fall in love with another man? Or if you happen to be a lesbian woman, how would it make you feel to be deprived of those same protections? It's about equality. Nothing more, nothing less. Civil rights are human rights. We've had too many people for too long destroy us from the inside out by pointing our fingers at others that aren't like us, that don't sound like us or look like us. The damage is palpable. I deal with it every day. I see the consequences of bullying. And it, I believe that we have reached that point where we can put to bed, once and for all, these McCarthy tactics that divide us rather than unite us. Thank you, Steve. Patrick? Uh, I supported the Defense of Marriage Act. I supported our state constitutional amendment defining marriage as between one man and one woman. Uh, obviously, there are disagreements in our society about this definition. I respect those that have disagreements, but that's where I fall. Now, uh, additionally, I would say this, that the, the courts have ruled and I don't agree with uh, judges uh, legislating from the bench, but we're a nation of laws and we have to deal with the consequences of it. My focus now is to make sure that religious organizations and uh, those with religious objections are not compelled to do things that are counter to their moral judgment and their uh, judgment based off their faith. And so that's my focus right now is to deal with the repercussions of this court case. Thank you, Patrick. Now, the, the, for final comments, Tate, would you like to start off? 30 seconds. If this election is about compassion and justice, there is a clear choice, and that is with me. If this election is about inclusion and forgiveness, then that election should be decided with me as the representative. We have had too much vitriol. We've had too much contempt. At the expense of our government, at the expense of our children, at the expense of our communities, I believe we've lost our way, 
And when we hear about the 99% and the 1%, I'd like to remind the congressmen and others there are the 13%. The 13% in Congress that have a disapproval rating at 90, you know, at, at 87%. 13% dis, you know, when we have that type of disconnect from Washington, where we don't have people coming to our communities to meet with those people who are suffering and hurting where they're hurting, I will not be that kind of congressman. I will represent everybody, regardless of your background, regardless of your religion, whether you have one or not, I will represent you to the best of my ability. Thank you for your vote, and thank you for being here, and thank you, Sebo. Thank you, Steve. Patrick. My focus is on being responsive to my constituents, and that's why I've actively worked with community organizations, uh, even that have different political persuasions than I do. I am not a voice for Moral Monday, and that is certainly okay. But I've, I've actually been very engaged in the business community, the nonprofit sector, uh, with institutions like UNC Asheville, to our health care facilities, to nonprofits like Evelyn Charities. I've been very actively engaged in, in uh, Buncombe County since you've given me the opportunity to represent you, and I'll continue to do that. This election is about economic policies and opportunity to grow jobs. I think my agenda is in keeping with growing jobs in Western North Carolina, doing the right thing for the long term of our nation. Finally, I'd like to thank Sebo uh, for having us here today, and especially for my wife, Julia, and our daughter, Cecilia, to sneak in while the debate was going on. Thanks so much. God bless.